the Grey Hat Beard Princess podcast. Hello and welcome to Grey Hat Beard Princess, the modern workplace podcast where we talk about all things Microsoft 365. I'm the Grey of Grey Hat Beard Princess. My name's Kevin McDonnell. I'm the Head of Practice Modern Workplace at CPS and Office Apps and Services MVP. And I'm the Hat and I'm a Technical Architect at the Microsoft Technology Centre. And your name's Al Erdley. And my name's, well, yeah, do I need to, I just, just the hat. Just in that'll, case, that'll do. just in case we have new listeners uh, <laughs> who've joined. Um, unfortunately, uh, our Beard and Princess can't uh, be with us today uh, on that, but we do have a great guest. Uh, Tomash, would you like to introduce, uh, introduce yourself? Oh, for sure. Hello, um, I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, my name is Tomasz Bostek. I'm coming from Warsaw in Poland. I'm Business Applications MVP. And uh, well, I call myself an expert in, in processes, in workflows, in business, in business processes. And as far as I know, this is the, one of the topics that we're going to talk about today. That's right. So, yeah, we, we, we've covered news and things. We had Luke on the show this week because builds kicking off just before recording. There hasn't been much news since that. So we thought we're just going to go straight into things and cover topics. So, uh, yeah, we're going to cover processes in teams. So we're not talking. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're not talking here the kind of processes for governance ones or the stuff that Microsoft runs. This is about how people can run their own business processes within Teams uh, and the kind of different options there. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, that's correct. That's what I meant. But I would like to extend it even like outside of the Teams because our Teams is just one of the platforms that we can run the Power Platform processes. Um, but they can live as well in our, in our Outlooks and as well in Power Automate Portal. But yes, basically, uh, that do was the idea. Do people still use Outlook? Well, yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they do. They send, a lot, of e- they send a lot of yeah. emails <laughs> from it, but they don't read the oh. emails. Yeah. Just, yeah. just to say yeah. how oh, massively Outlook, Outlook is being used. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. So, so we're we're kind of talking things around Teams and use of Power Platform as well. So, what what yeah, I guess what kind of thing can you can do? It seems quite a broad range of stuff within Teams. And well, this is this is uh, the topic that really has multiple um, dimensions. So, like this basic functionality of processes that we can build in Microsoft Teams, um, and I mean those that student developers can create. So using Power Platform, Power Automate, Power Apps, uh, maybe Dataverse for Teams as well. Uh, they are somehow limited to uh, well, what is out of box, especially when speaking about, for example, approval workflows. However, uh, well, we can extend it and we can build our custom processes just like working directly on data uh, that is stored in Dataverse because everything about processes obviously lives in Dataverse. And um, what Teams is as well bringing to make these processes more interesting or more engaging um, is Adaptive Cards. And that technology lives Mm -hmm. in Microsoft Teams and it's been there for years and it's evolving. Last year brought really lots of changes and lots of new cool features. Then combining combining those platform processes together with Adaptive Cards really makes those business processes are very interesting and easy to use for the end users. For Thomas, what for those who don't know what an adaptive card is, what what it, how would you describe an adaptive card in in Teams? Okay, so the adaptive cards um, is a garage project of Microsoft. Um, well, it was like founded. Do you know, I started, didn't know that. <laughs> right, really, it started. started? Wow. I think like 2017 or 18, somewhere like that, or maybe even like around that year. Uh, it was first uh, lead by, led by uh, Matt Heidinger. Heidinger. Mm. Uh, and the goal was to allow basically anyone, developers, citizen developers uh, and makers as well, to easily create nice looking um, forms or pieces of content that automatically adopts user interface and user experience of the application where they are displayed. And so the goal was to create some kind of a SDK or a framework that actually takes the content, which in this case is JSON, and it translates it and renders into an adaptive card, into this 
tile that you can see in Microsoft Teams or in Outlook as well, or in variety of other applications like even Microsoft Viva. Uh, and that it inherits the look and feel of the host, so the application where it is being displayed, so that us as designers, we don't really need to take care of colors, of fonts, of paddings, margins, and all these things because those are inherited. But we just need to focus on content. So and, um, and things like being adaptive to working on mobile device, iPad, as you say, it doesn't matter which yeah. system it's coming through. It should look not exactly. the same, but suitable for that system as well. So exactly right. So if for all those to, people who love, you know, developers love designing things and doing UIs, <laughs> it means they have less to have to think about there, but still get something that looks good as well. Of course. And uh, as well, the major benefit of adaptive cards is that they are interactive. So they don't only, I mean, you don't mm. necessarily need to use them just to display information, but also you can build forms uh, and then collect information, collect feedback. That is very valuable and, inter I mean, important when speaking about the processes. And this is why they are making those processes in Microsoft Teams such flexible and, and uh, engaging, because uh, apart from just sending um, you know, hard or not not uh, attractively looking tasks to to users uh, over the emails. You can just send uh, nice looking uh, cards with images, with content, with tables, with well buttons as well. That allows them to directly take an action in there, so they don't have to navigate to like for example lists of tasks where they have to uh, respond at proof reject, uh, or they don't need to navigate away from Outlook, but the action that well, this is activity that um, interaction with the task with whatever they are assigned uh, or expected to do can be done directly from the place where they display that adaptive card. And as you said, uh, Kevin, this can be done from Outlook desktop, Outlook mobile, right. Teams desktop, Teams mobile, um, Teams for the web, like any any host um, is this handling and is this now supporting the adaptive cards. It just makes life a lot a lot easier to interact, doesn't it? Yeah. When you when you yeah. actually have that engaging inf all the information you need to actually react, it's engaging in the way it's presented. It's not just you know text and uh, and looking boring. It's easy to read, and you can actually react to it there and then without changing context. And now yeah. one one uh, new thing that is coming up, or well, it is already in there. However, it's like available for me as a citizen developer, but it's uh, meant right now for the developers. So Adaptive Cards, Microsoft Teams, they live uh, like with a bot. That's There's always a bot as a, uh, as a that host, I mean not host, but um, as that thing that actually sends to Microsoft Teams and then Teams renders them. But it's the bot that is as well waiting for the response from users. Uh, and well, you can speak about it automate process. Just power automates, couldn't you, for adaptive cards? Right, it doesn't right, have to do. be a bot, but However, yeah, bot's a very nice way of doing it. Yes, yes, but when you are sending adaptive cards from Power Automate to Microsoft Teams, you'll notice that they're all sent by Power Automate bot. Right? Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, that's true. Of course. So there is always so you don't need to have written your own bot yourself, yeah. I guess, uh, on there. But uh, yes, yeah, no, that's true. It does mm -hmm. indeed come from a bot. Look at you smiling that's correct. there. So okay, <laughs> he's caught him when, out. When sending those <laughs> out of box, <laughs> right. So then when you're sending those out of box that we've got to Power Automate, then you don't need to write your own bot because well, that's that's for the that's the job for the flow bot. That's what is it's, yeah. what it is name. But it's actually, um, you know, limited because it's just, some generic bot that is uh, meant to send only those cards that uh, are, uh, are that you can send from uh, from Power to Mate. Um, now, what I meant uh, about those new things that are coming up and developers are able to do that is universal actions. And mm -hmm. this new feature in Adaptive Cards actually allows you to create um, like a different experience for the same Adaptive Card, but uh, like seen by people having different roles in the process. So then you're initi initiating a process, you're setting like an approval task or whatever task to an approver. And an approver sees this adaptive card with information about the task and the buttons to approve reject. Meanwhile, the person who requested the approval sees just the information about the current status of the approval. And other people oh, who nice. are particip participating in the process, they only see like 
general information about the the task, but they cannot participate in the process. So is that so you could put it this, onto a shared uh, sorry, a shared channel. channel is the wrong word. A channel within a team, That's everyone can see it. But depending on your role, uh, you'll see slightly different things that you can build into there. Yes, really yes, that's the goal. Plus, uh, plus that is as well allowing you to refresh those cards. So, like whenever you're opening the card, you'll be able to see the latest information. It's like, for example, if someone has already responded to the task, but there are more more assignees still pending, then the card will display you the latest information. So, those universal actions, uh, this is already supported by Microsoft Teams. It is already we are within the SDK that is um, deployed to Microsoft Teams. However, to benefit from that, you have to write your own bot, which is able to distribute this content based on the roles uh, and then handle the responses and handle refreshing of those cards. Well, so, so you, you can have, use you like... have to manage who can who's actually seeing what and who's interacting based on the roles that, that you've defined for those people. Mm -hmm. Well, you can actually... Uh, see a little bit of that because um, in scenarios where you're sending an, a task to Microsoft Teams, this out-of-box task that is being returned by the assigner task action in Power Automate. So like this this action as well returns a code of adaptive card that you can just use and send it to, to Teams. So now when you send it uh, and then when you complete this task from, for example, action items in Power Automate portal, then as well, this task in Microsoft Teams is going to be closed, uh, completed. So this is a little bit of this experience that uh, you can interact with the same content using different channels. However, these outcomes are in sync. So whichever channel you will choose, uh, others yeah. will be as well updated. So that's the same goal about the universal elections. But this is like to say, um, cherry on the top is that you can really uh, bring different experience to the. I mean, different experience uh, showing the content to, to the people having different roles. And that's really cool. Um, how I just how does that work? Most, so if, uh, of that if you've got like, cards, so someone, let, let's go for the sort of simple approval one. Someone's posted that approval. It's gone via the bot. It appears in the channel. Uh, and then obviously other chat goes on and it sort of shuffles up. If someone hits approve, does it bring it back to the, the kind of bottom of the chat? Or does it, do people have to sort of scroll up and see if it's approved or? Well, you know, I guess it's it like just the, might disappear for that case. Yeah, or? I mean, it's it's just like the every every message in Teams. So like, if it's if it's posted at some time in the on the timeline, and then there is more content shown, then obviously even if the task is approved and completed, it will just stay where it was. Mm. Um, so it's it's not like being posted a new card, but the original one is being refreshed and replaced with a with a different one. Yeah. So I'm guessing if you had, you know, you talked about the idea of maybe having a two step approval, you might actually want to post a second card for the second approval so that people for can example, see yes. in that stage just to make sure it appeared during the bottom and manage bits of that. Mm -hmm. But so, so, so it's what is benefit. So it can, can you. So if I'm understanding it right with the universal actions, you could post an action to somebody. So a task, put it into a channel. People, everybody can see it based on their role. Would you be able to then post that same action into you know, a chat with somebody and go, oh, you as this role, you need to approve it. If they approved it in that chat, then the channel would actually update and you'd, you'd see then it's updated. And if they yeah. didn't do it, then you could post yeah. it again back to them. Your bot could do that and you would actually be able to prompt them and, and essentially push that action out to other people when they need to actually complete it and, and carry on reminding them until they complete it. Well, basically with the universal actions and your custom bot, you can implement whatever logic you want. Yeah. Um, the benefit of, of uh, universal action is that it, it's not limited to only Microsoft Teams. You can send the same uh, adaptive card mm. or yeah. you know, the actions or cards in, within the same process to users using different channels like you can send actionable message to power uh, to, to sorry to, to outlook so that that assignee uh, is able to not only complete this task from their private conversation in teams but i can as well co complete it uh, using outlook or you can just build a custom application which is embedded somewhere on a website yeah. or in sharepoint yeah. as well uh, so that they there. can as well participate in that uh, hit so the, it's, hit it's, the, from every the, the goal is that you have like 
Right, and all those are in sync. So whenever, yeah. whenever, like whichever channel you choose, all those will be updated uh, accordingly. And that's that's the power. That sounds quite. That uh, sounds quite of, interesting. I can I can think of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's right. a lot of processes that could do with that kind of ability to to manage actions in that way right. and to use those those universal actions. And that brings me to actually uh, another thing that uh, we already have, and what, the other one which is rolling out in Microsoft uh, in, in Power Automate, because what well, I mentioned it is impossible to have the same experience using Power Automate out of box actions. Um, although somehow it is like it, it, it requires some a bit more of of, uh, uh, of gymnastics, but um, <laughs> you can you can send an adaptive card to to Outlook and those adaptive cards, which are called their actionable messages, you can define their like target URL. So where the content from this, this message is going to be sent after user hits submit. And so um, this this host, the, the target URL can be as for another Power Automate. So like you can send the response from the card to another Power Automate and that Cloudflow can actually replace the card, which is displayed in Outlook. So you, you can, you can complete one of these, for example, scenarios that you would like to update users' um, task if they complete it in Microsoft uh, is or in, in Outlook. And then speaking about Microsoft Teams, we are as well able to send adaptive card to Microsoft Teams, obviously, and we are able to grab the response. However, um, before May, we were not able to get the response from that card using a different process than the one that actually submitted it. And then the, the Cloudflow, which sent the adaptive card in the first place, was like on hold until the response was received. However, with the uh, latest updates uh, in May, we are now able to assign an ID to an adaptive card that is sent to Microsoft Teams and then create another Cloudflow, which is triggered by responses coming from adaptive cards having this particular ID. And so now you're so able to the send benefit? an adaptive card with... Well, the largest benefit is that it is um, that you can now walk around or uh, don't care about the limits that Power Automate have because it's a, yeah. uh, sorry, has because so you avoid because the as you know, amounts, that's the... yes, because the timeout for those waitings is always thirty days, uh, mm -hmm. and that was as well uh, related to the adaptive cards action. I mean, the adaptive cards waiting action. So with that, you can have one cloud for which is sending adaptive card to Teams, and then another one that is actually handing the response. And now the last piece which was missing in all this, uh, let's say, puzzle was the ability to, as well, refresh the card. Because what is the benefit from having the response sent to another Microsoft, uh, to another cloud though, while you're still unable to close that adaptive card? So like after user response, you would like obviously to um, prevent him from responding again and again and again. Today it is not possible, but uh, there is a new update rolling out, uh, a new action in, in Cloudflows um, in this Microsoft Teams stack of actions that will actually allow you to update an adaptive card. So you will be able to send a new one to replace an existing one. So with these features, we will be able to create a little bit of this experience that we could have or we can like we could build with universal actions still we won't be able to create different experience per row but we'll be at least able to have this um in sync experience between different clients uh that can be handled through cloud flows that's quite that raises some quite interesting ideas when you because I mean, with tasks and processes, you know, you always want them to keep moving. You always want somebody to actually respond. But if they're on holiday, if they're, you know, doing something else and they didn't see it, or you know, if it's they don't act timesheets. Yeah, sort of you with time. Yeah. I wasn't going to mention you with timesheets, <laughs> but that did cross my mind, Kev. But it's it sounds like a great way to actually just be able to say we're going to remind you, pester you every three days to do this action mm. until you do it and then update um which yeah i i can see uh if any of my colleagues are listening to this they know what's coming in some of the the power <laughs> automate arm building at the moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm last last thinking about those uh, approvals in in team uh, sorry in power automate uh, they are as well somehow limited because uh unfortunately you cannot 
using out of box actions reassign mm. assign tasks to someone else yeah. like only the current assignee can do that however uh because all these data lives in dataverse and um it's quite easy to just manipulate it to the dataverse actions i mean obviously you need to have premium licenses but it's good, so, <laughs> and, and you need to have permissions yeah. <laughs> well, yes, you need to have permissions, obviously. So you need to like, create it on um, on the system uh, service account or the system admin account, system customizer account, actually. So you wouldn't use system admin. <laughs> no, no, I mean, the, the system customizer role is, uh, is yeah. enough to to manipulate this data. Or there is as well a role that is called uh, approvals admin uh, in Dataverse. So uh, whichever account has it is able to read, write, um, update data in tables related to, the, to approvals. Uh, and so with that, you can really build processes on top of Dataverse, which are still using approvals functionality, but allows you to create uh, such scenarios like reassignments or substitutions or, you know, completing approvals after a specific number of responses is collected, not to wait for all responses. And yeah. well, and then possibilities are unlimited, actually. Yeah, it's uh, there's there's so much potential, isn't there, when you start to look at the processes that so many people are using in their day to day work and you kind of go, so where are you waiting? What is the time that it's taking for you to do things? And inevitably, if they're getting notifications and they're being prompted that actually there are things to do, it it makes it much easier for them to actually get those things done because so many of these processes are, oh, well, I'm going to send an email to you and ask you to fill in this spreadsheet and do this, and then I'm going to ask you to send it over to that person. And if you can automate it and provide visibility, it mm -hmm. just helps everybody in terms of how they can actually operate and how effective they can be at doing their doing their job. Plus, and if, if you allow them to actually complete this task directly from the client where they receive the notification, yeah. then you're even more sure that this will be done in time and just like ad hoc. And I love that that refresh as well. It's one of the things I love about the approvals. If people approve in the email, it updates it. The next person can see it. They don't they see straight away. They don't have to get a sort of secondary email and make sure they've read that one and not this one. They know from the original email, it now shows they don't have to do anything more. So that you're not wasting everyone's time having to go and look at things and see, oh, should I approve that? Go through a different system, then suddenly find out it's been approved. It's there straight away for you. And I think that's that's really nice. And that, that's what I really like about what you're saying with the universal actions, that great stuff you get with approvals, you can apply to your own processes as, as well and do it. And I, I guess the other thing, you could build yeah. your own approval process. Uh, I know one of the challenges you often get is you can't really customise what the approvals look like. It looks like an approval email and that's it. Now you can kind of have a very branded use, use the um, adaptive cards with those universal actions to make it look exactly what you want. Maybe you could have, you know, a nice fluffy kitten for approve and a, a nasty dog for reject. Not trying to show my own biases or anything <laughs> yeah. there, but you know, you can you can build it in to fault with a brand or what you're trying to get across from that so that's that's mm -hmm. really interesting so i guess at the moment though that's when you when you talked about using bots with universal actions that's a bot framework that's a uh a, a full code i'm trying to remember the right word pro codes uh, development for it you yeah. know you're not talking about low code solutions uh, at least yet uh, maybe maybe that will come down the line who knows but uh, at the moment you're talking about going down the full code solution for things Yes, unfortunately, yes. So you need to be like a pro developer to, I mean, you know, if you know how to build bots, if you know C sharp, you can just write it. But uh, as far as I know, and I, as far as I heard news and announcements, there is nothing easier coming. Mm. Not, not nowhere this year. So maybe, maybe there is something planned, but it's really um, okay. hidden from the from the wider audience. <laughs> I, I guess it may be something that's built potentially gets built into power virtual agents but maybe not that kind of cross-platform view of things that you can get mm. and, and again i have no no i haven't dug into this so i'm not well, giving anything away but uh, actually, actually, I, I think yeah. as you say it's not it's quite nice with the, the bot framework composer uh, you know you don't need to go down the full c-sharp route to be able to do these things you can involve more people in that and and, and embed some mm. of those within there it's probably be It'd be um, interesting to see if that's got universal actions, actually. Thinking about this PVA, um, it's true that what you mentioned that maybe Bill will bring, bring something. I honestly haven't seen a lot of love from Microsoft to this product <laughs> recently, so I sort of count that 
there will be something cool announced during the, the build. So let's see. Would be nice. Yeah. 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 And I, I, it's funny, I was uh, speaking to a client recently doing discovery and they, they kind of, yeah, we've heard bits about bots. Can you show some stuff? And I was like, yeah, yeah, here's power version. Click, click, click. Here, you've got a bot. And they were like, oh, I, I can just create a bot in Teams like that. Why isn't everyone doing this? And it's like, it's a very good question, to be honest. <laughs> on that. Well, I think, you know, certainly for some of those scenarios, and I said, to, oh, I warn you, you will hit limitations with these ones and you'll, you'll possibly want to go down the full, fully developed bot framework route for what you get in there it's fantastic it's a great way to really work out whether whether your processes would suit the the kind of conversational ai way of doing things and 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 get things going there and then work out where you want it to go from from that afterwards but uh, right. it's also good to find out whether your organization will respond to a bot uh, yeah. in terms of being able to i mean one of the things with those processes is you know our teams little t teams <laughs> already using big t teams you know effectively as a collaboration portal for content in which case mm. you know we see a lot of a lot of teams being able to put a channel in to go these are the notifications or these are the actions and be able to to track them and see them and have a single place to go to actually see all of those and when they start mm. to get you know multiple processes coming together you know whether it's just doing it within teams and just doing it within you know the the tools that you have as part of Office 365 or Dataverse. It's also when you start to get external things like ServiceNow pushing things into Teams and be able to actually see some of those integrations going in mm. as well it starts to be very very powerful. True. Um, so, and yeah. So I was going to say, so Thomas, it, it, you do a lot of process automation and you do you know work with a lot of clients. What? If, if you were just getting started doing process automation and you're a citizen developer and you're going, oh, actually, that sounds really interesting. What do you think are the most the most common processes and most common sort of actions that you see people actually automating in, in their processes when they start out? Well, obviously, this is a variety of different approvals. Um, and well, basically, when speaking about the Power Automate, that's the platform dedicated for these business automations. Um, so it's not meant for integration, it's meant for uh, for either personal or the business automation within the companies. And so when I'm speaking about the most common use cases, this is always some kind of an approval, either a simple one where there's just one level of approvals or complex that are multiple level of approvals. Uh, sometimes they are just short, uh, quick, within weeks, I mean, within a week, uh, sometimes they required to build uh, a more sophisticated design of uh, all the cloud flows uh, because they need to run more than 30 days. Um, and then speaking about teams, I can't say that there is just a single um, or the, the main, the main, sorry, the, the department that requires the majority of these processes like, you know, HR. Um, it's usually that uh, starting to when I start, when I start working with a customer, uh, that usually involves one team or the one department, and then it's usually spreading out, and other departments and other teams are requiring or asking for the uh, processes too. And uh, as I said, usually those are approvals. Sometimes as well, those are different kind of automations to help them with reminders or to help them build some automation, automated rules uh, on top of, of data. Sometimes, uh, but very rarely recently, uh, it was as well about some kind of integration. So to, uh, for example, move data from one system to another. But those are mostly cases for the logic apps. Yeah. I think, you you know, one thing that I've seen a lot is the notifications. It's the reminders, you know, the things like policies Nickbot. that are going to, yeah, yeah, policies that are going to expire and reminding people, you know, three do months. Time sheets. Oh, you need yeah. to do this, you know, timesheets. <laughs> you keep going on about timesheets, Kevin. You, you really love timesheets, don't you? I had a reminder just before this, which is why it's, uh, yeah, front of mind so, at the moment. Mm. So, but haven't yeah, changed, I think, Dale. Haven't changed. No, no, you haven't. No. But I think the reminders are really useful, especially for those things that are they kind of fall back, you know, whether yeah. it's six months, nine, 12 months. Those are the things that are really useful to actually remind people of and, and prompt them to do things 
and and also to be able to get it through different mechanisms you know people are so used to having a backlog of emails all these unread ones to be able to kind of okay they haven't replied to three emails let's hit them in teams let's hit them in this channel and do it a little bit more publicly let's do it from here and kind of have it, it just gets people attention if you keep hitting people in the same way in the same place they they kind of ignore it so to be able to kind of have this same adaptive card come in in different areas uh, at different times really really helps helps the adoption and helps people actually notice and do do something with it as well. Um, to one, one, one question, obviously, obviously, you know, we were talking about processes, but it's generally business processes we're talking about here. How would you go about, you know, someone says, I want to automate something. How would you go about kind of working out what they want to do and then turning that into things with Teams and Power Platform? Well, that basically requires a bit of discussion. Uh, and better understanding of what actually is the current process. Um, I usually ask that there is at least one person on the on the on the customer side that is going to be like the project manager uh, on on the behalf of the team that requires an automation, because there has to be always someone, usually the single person that gathers all those requirements and allows to or allows me then uh, to interact or to ask questions uh, whenever I'm in doubt. Um, I also try and ask customers to write down or describe in written language how the process that they currently have look like, uh, what applications are involved, uh, what tools they are using. And I'm trying to build as well my own interpretation in BPMN. And we're just trying to do workshops to understand. Uh, uh, I mean, to see apologies if, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> for people listening. You, you said BPMN, right? What, uh, what is that? As a business process, uh, my, <laughs> my it's like a business too. process. It, it's yeah. a way of mapping out the business process. Uh, the sort of notification, uh, like a markup language. Yep. Sort of things. That right? Yeah. Uh, yes, it involves uh, different shapes to to define different actions that are taking part in process. Uh, so a, and a bit like a flow diagram, but more than that. Indeed. That's what they. Yes, think. and so and so with that, uh, we're just having some kind of a theoretically written or, or described process, and we're just going to go trying to go through it to see if all steps are actually involved. Um, well, and then I'm trying to, I'm starting to build in it. Uh, and of course, it then requires testing and involvement of, of the customer to see if the outcomes are as expected. Now, speaking about as well, trying to figure out how the processes work uh, and mining them or, or getting information uh, how they how they work. Now, uh, there is a cool tool uh, in Power Platform called the Process, uh, Process Advisor. Mm. And as long as the process actually takes place uh, on the computer so that every of its step is digital, then customer is able to use it and then ask a team to install application that actually records their steps. And so while they are doing the process, their steps are being recorded. And um, as a result of this recording, the product or the, the tool is producing a kind of a Power BI report with a diagram of how many variants of the same process exist in the team, um, which variant is the most effective, uh, what are the bottlenecks on like on which step there are bottlenecks, um, and m multiple other insights from the same process. Uh, and then it works like it utilizes the technology that uh, as well the part of my desktop, so the RPA is using, and RPA is robotic reverse automation. Uh, therefore, it's re recording all the steps the user is doing on their machine. But then as soon as uh, as the, the process goes out of the digital world and it's, for example, a sheet of paper which has to be signed, then mm -hmm. it's getting just a little bit uh, more difficult. But still, uh, through the workshops and, and trying to um, involve as, as many team members as possible and just one person to gather all these requirements together, it's really feasible to, to get understanding that this general understanding of how the process works. And then, well, to uh, next steps of fine tuning of what is built, we can achieve it. That's interesting. And, and have you used that business process advisor with, with clients much? 
has it has it been useful? Yes. So I've still seen it and played around with it, but n- never yeah. actually used it properly. I've been playing around with it as uh, as well, but as well, I haven't used it really for a productive scenario, just as a POC that could deliver a value. And then unfortunately, mm. I don't have really like the productive uh, product feedback on how this uh, product performs and and uh, well, how much how much value can bring. How after the POCs yeah. we had, it looked promising. Yeah, I've, yeah. Been, I've been trying it out as well, and it, it looks like it. I'm waiting for the process to run a lot more to be able to get more information yeah. about the different paths through processes as well. Um, but it does look like it could provide some quite interesting recommendations. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's the interesting one. So I've, I've been working with a client recently where it was uh, he, he talked about where it deviated to paper. This was a paper based process that the final step was they then wrote up that piece of paper. It was a, a kind of uh, a getting approval to come into a building and things and literally went through various people as pieces of paper. And it was it was interesting. Other challenges you get with that is uh, transforming processes. And uh, something you said there, Thomas, is you've got kind of the boundaries. Like if you send an email, you can add a few comments afterwards and maybe indent things and maybe forward it on someone else and then forward it on there. If you're getting a, a more formalized process, you generally don't have the freedom so much within that or you have to build in that freedom and it's it's part of the the, i always found part of the requirement gathering going okay you do this now do you need to do this is this an essential bit or is this just habit that people have gone through because it's evolved during the years and no one's actually questioned it if we make this digital yeah you know um signatures is a classic example do you actually need a signature or does the fact it's come from an email guarantee it's come from them or it's come from their login? Surely that that meets the needs now as well. And trying to trying to reduce some of the steps or even just make it as easy as possible. Don't ask people questions for things that you can look up yourself. Yeah, the, the classic. What's your name? What's your email? Can you upload a photo? I've got that. It's in Azure AD. Don't ask people that again unless they really, really need to ask it and things like that. And I, I think that's it, it. It's one thing I, I loved it when you said you want to talk about processes, because I think that that kind of taking the processes that people have had in their heads and trying to automate it, trying to look at the tools to make it more efficient. I, it's such a fascinating process and trying to make sure that people will actually adopt it and you're not changing things too much because some people just won't be able to cope with uh, the idea of kind of keeping up with things and and having to use teams when they've been used to using bits of paper so looking at looking at the different levels of adoption you'll get from different people is is key to this as well and i, I think if you're if you're taking from a process that maybe people have been doing digitally you've already you've made things a bit easier but if it's if it's someone emails so and so who emails so and so who emails so and so you know if you ask them to write them down they'll put that they'll ignore the 20 times out of uh, 50 that they actually email someone else check with that and then actually they'll go and speak to them and then update it and skip a few steps and if you kind of don't allow them to skip steps things fall apart and people don't like it because they want to go back to the easier way of doing things and it's I, I, I always love that challenge where people go yeah this is a really simple process just go to so-and-so they sign it off go so so done it's like and what about this oh yeah, yeah. And, and what about this scenario oh yeah and what about if you have to go back a step do you go back to the beginning yeah oh except when oh and and when we do this and I, I, trying to flesh out as many of those things as possible because otherwise and well, you, you could go mvp and then sort of enhance it as you go along but quite often if you've done that you've said yeah we're going to this great new digitized process and it doesn't work for the people using it boom you failed it's fallen flat people kind of go back to the old one which is can be risky especially if it's paper you know you've got gdpr issues with uh, bits of names being kept all over the place all these challenges that are there that people have just kind of accepted because they've been there for a while trying to make sure you get all into that with it um is great and uh, what i love with the power platform is that you've actually got quite a few processes like approvals that you can show the benefit of very quickly and easily as well you don't necessarily need to pick up everything and then you can sort of start building and building after that as well right but as, as you mentioned uh this digitalization's most important step um or the benefit is that uh, you're just not trying to build this process one-to-one as it as it exists but there's always this mm-hmm. requirement even yeah. if not written even if not expressed verbally 
to optimize it, to make it more efficient, to make it easier. Um, and then, as you said as well, it's true that, uh, well, if, even if you have a team of users, of, of employees who are having that process somewhere, uh, and it's not structured, it's not really anywhere described, it's not procedure, uh, it's very flexible. And then they're just using it in, intu intuitively. And then when you ask them, it's very easy for them. But then as you start drilling down and asking questions about the exceptions, about the different paths, mm. not those happy ones, then they're just starting. <laughs> then either they block because they don't know, because they forgot or they haven't had that kind of experience, that, that kind of scenario uh, like recently uh, done, or yeah, <laughs> they're just start, that's, start, start that's being the confused. Thing. The, the happy thing, path yeah. is 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 what most people go with and you know the number of times you see the happy path implemented and oh we've tested it it goes all the way through but it's all yeah. of those exceptions it's all of those yeah. choices where you go so what happens here oh well, i don't know oh what, what happens well, when the manager says no just to prove it circumvent the whole thing can you do that well yeah. no you can't anymore no you can't yeah. what happens when nobody comes back and responds well, yeah, no yes. i don't think that's ever happened OK, what should happen if nobody yeah. responds, you know, and it's yeah. it does take a lot more questions to find mm. all of those alternate paths. But I think that's where your your diagram comes in as well. You know, yeah. if you're true, mapping yeah. out a process, you know, if like you, four boxes and suddenly this line goes up there and yeah, another line, line goes yeah, down there. And, and, then, then, the and then you get another and then you get another screen and then it starts <laughs> yeah. to build out. Yeah. But that's the thing, isn't it? If you if you can visualize it and you can talk it through and you can almost role play it, then you should be pretty confident that you've got all of the, the decision points covered in terms of, you know, what's going to happen at each each point in it. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's certainly one thing that I've found with a lot of a lot of citizen development. They start by implementing and building without actually drawing out the, the, mm -hmm. the process first. Uh, a lot of developers do that as well, don't they, Kev? um just start coding you know without without designing yeah, yeah gary yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah drawing it out i think is worth you know i mean workshopping it and going through and understanding all of those paths how long it's going to take how many times are you going to be running it you know that's a really important yeah. one as well you know or i'm going to run this storing in a sharepoint list then how many yeah, times I'm, is it going to run i'm you know? going to run this five thousand times a year okay maybe <laughs> sharepoint isn't the right thing yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> how are you going to report on it as well you know do you need to measure but, key points and and i think that's one of the lovely things about putting in power platform putting in teams is you've got that reporting uh, and are you talking about the process advice i was using the other day that you can you can point it as the existing flow and actually see how long the different steps are going to take so if you've got multiple approval steps within there you can see where the blockers are you can get reports off that you can run an ex and, and see that information you could look at you know are, are you going to put an sla in for these things you can see how long it's been taking up till now and it, it gives you a lot more capability as well than just email so and so and wait for them mm -hmm. to to go to that shared mailbox until they reply back so uh, you you get a lot more information which is really useful Kevin, now what that you mentioned that uh, i don't know if, if you mentioned because you saw this new edition that has appeared uh, last week uh because in power to make you actually now can see in each cloudflow you have built um a small tile that is coming from the process advisor which is now analyzing in real time your cloudflows and so it that, that has just appeared, has it? Yeah, yeah yes, <laughs> I mean, they noticed it recently. Uh, last, last so. And that so nice. the, the purpose, the purpose of this, uh, yes, advisory uh, from the press advisor application is actually delivering information about how the, how the workflow is performing, um, how long it takes in average, what which actions are taking how much time, what are those bottlenecks you mentioned, um, and then lots of other information you can really read from analyzing this uh, run data. And that's very info, very important for us as designers because, uh, well, with that we can really improve the the mm. processes over time, make them run faster, or, for example, split them maybe into more processes just calling each other, uh, because that way this could be more uh, more more efficient. I um, think that's it. Only it, just it, landed. It's <laughs> a, it's an art form designing flows to uh, to run efficiently and. Uh, I mean, I'm, I know I, I 
not an expert in all of them, but I know there's certain tips and tricks for uh, making them run faster. And it takes a long time to to get your head around them, you know, arrays and finding the right things in arrays <laughs> and the lack of variables and there's all sorts of things that that can make it faster. But that process optimizer, the advisor will actually give you quite a lot of information about, oh, well, this is taking two seconds. This is taking mm -hmm. five seconds. What should you do about it? So we, we, we've talked to, uh, about quite a few bits of technology. We talked about kind of approvals. We talked about dataverse, dataverse for teams, how and even logic apps you, you touch on there. How, how does this apply to licensing for things? I, I mean, Jim Leaf, you've got an E3 license, which a lot of people have. You, you've got Power Automate. You've got the flows in there. You've got dataverse for teams. Uh, it, you, you mentioned and, and I I have to admit, I was a little bit slow realizing this as well, that all approvals are in Dataverse, but you don't need a Dataverse license to use approvals. You, Yes, they're in Dataverse, but they're kind of there in a, in a I guess, a free instance, as long as you're just using approvals for it. Are there, are there any other license considerations to, towards some of these processes? You said approvals, actually, uh, as you mentioned, they, they live in Dataverse, but us as users, we don't uh, have permissions to write to those tables. We only have permissions to read from them. And then the write is being done on behalf of a, a flow account. So this is like how those those licenses are not needed from a user using approvals. Um, and well, basically for most of the scenarios that uh, we're discussing today, you don't need any premium license. Um, however, for some of them, for example, doing uh, substitutions or doing some like reassignments on behalf of others, and then just working directly on Dataverse data, then obviously you have to have those uh, per user licenses or per flow if if you'd like to create some kind of a uh, system system flow or the uh, yeah, service flow that is going to run and check who is on the leaf and who should be substituted. Um, as well, speaking about uh, that scenario with actionable messages in, in Outlook and then sending the response from the, from the message to a Cloudflow, that unfortunately as well requires the premium license because that Cloudflow has to be triggered through the HTTP request, which is premium. Um, but, well, as I said, from the most of those scenarios that we are uh, trying to automate, then the E3 license is just enough. That's right. and, and then if you wanted to use the universal actions with with your own bots, then you'd be hosting that bot. So depending oh, how you hosted it, probably an, yeah. an app service. So you've got the Azure costs on that, which aren't too bad. And you could host it various other ways within there. And I, I guess in that scenario, you're talking about having the premium license. You could use, presumably you could use logic apps with universal actions uh, as well on there. Therefore, you've possibly got the lower slightly higher barrier to entry from using logic apps but at, at a lower cost uh, of, of per run yeah the only i see sure like you would be able to use logic apps instead of cloudflow to for example handle those responses from actionable messages in outlook um, one thing to note is that uh, logic apps because they do not work per environment or maybe because from because of some of the limitations, they do not work with approvals. So like you can't create, you cannot uh, assign tasks uh, using logic apps. This is only feasible using Cloudflow's. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Well, well, the, the, I think... other, the other thing that always gets me is if you're going to create a flow that's going to be triggered by an item. So in relation to an item. You can only put that in the default environment. Well, yes, that is the same. Speaking about this new trigger that I mentioned that allows you to handle a response from an adaptive card uh, using a different Cloudflow. As of today, it as well requires you to build that other Cloudflow in a default environment. Well, that's that's a limitation. Maybe it will be changed in the future. That would be nice. <laughs> Definitely. Especially when you have the center of excellence talking about having nice environments and sandboxes and then getting stuck with it. But uh, yeah, well, that's, that's interesting. No, yeah. I, I, I think, sorry, go. 
I just just wanted to drop with that, you know, and learning all about the ALM and having different environments for dev, prod, and test, <laughs> and then you have it's a process in itself. The environment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there guess, are guess... there are some gotchas, aren't there? There's uh, and the, but the, I think this is why you know the citizen developers. There's there's things that they can do, but if it's going to become more of a production solution, a line of business application that's going to be critical to a business then there needs to be you know the any organization needs to be prepared for that journey to have more governance and to understand where those those constraints and those boundaries are mm. yeah absolutely and I, I guess the other thing thinking about process you know it talks about the benefits of being able to measure and see how long things the other benefit is governance and i mean we could do a whole show on that kind of governance of processes but by putting within there you've got things like a center of excellence to help manage and understand how many flows are out there you can use various reports to see which flows are being used which aren't you can manage a lot of these things from from happening as well so you've got a lot lot more control about knowing what's going on from a central perspective as well as a kind of from a business process you can give those citizen developers who understand that process hopefully uh, the power to do things themselves but also make sure that things carry on running uh, nicely and I, I still live in fear at uh, an Intex workflow that someone managed to create I think they've got 100 580 separate independent actions you know you can make sure people aren't doing stupid things like that uh, unnecessarily as well so you've got central control that you can put in place around it all as well which is generally a good thing I hope yeah of course I mean governance is always a good thing and knowing what's uh, what's going on in your environments and who's building what is a very crucial thing yeah, I mean, we, we were chatting with a client today of one of the other things is you can look and centrally say, well, hang on, this team's doing all these processes for something. These teams doing these processes, these team, maybe we could bring these things together and put some commonality around it and trying to get streamlined some of the processes rather than everyone doing it independently as well. You've got that that visibility into what's happening as well. It was a fascinating chat today about power apps and whether you could, is there a catalogue of what the power apps of what everyone else is doing? So you can go and say, oh, that would be useful for my area. I need to learn from that. And it, it, it's true. You want that visibility across the org to know what else could be possible. Uh, and I, I think that's something that you, you should also consider within an organisation is where you've got these fantastic processes is tell other people about them because they either could have the same process or a similar one that they want to do themselves so help people learn and, and share those those successes as much as possible so that you can get more success across everyone mm -hmm. yeah and then what i learned as well working as an it uh, at a company is that actually there were different people different employees out of it trying their first steps with the platform building flows or apps and at any time they got stuck, they were asking IT for support. And on the other hand, um, there were at the same time other employees already who've been there, who were able as well to ask, uh, to, sorry, were able to um, help them. Uh, so as well, the Center of Excellence brings you this, mm. this information where you already have those citizen developers, those so-called champions, and we can as well build some right. kind of a, um well program to, to to help others so that others as well aware what to ask what to post questions whom to ask and it's not that it's always asd uh who is the <laughs> source of all the answers but, but you have well other other employees the same a, as you a, are a community that could help yeah. you. right so so this is the center of excellence is also bringing information about your prospective champions and prospective season devs so then mm -hmm. you can create some kind of program and just simply join them let them well join yeah and that's i think that's that's it isn't it it's not just the technology it is about sharing sharing the people. lessons and sharing yeah. processes and ideas and and being able to go actually i've got an idea but i don't know how to implement it can someone help me yeah yeah exactly and and also brings brings together people who 
uh, who speak the same language and I'm, I'm not talking about English, French, Polish on there. They're, they're talking the language of the business and they understand that they're, they're saying the right way rather than technology that, you know, the IT guys who come in, the IT team who will come in and uh, talk the technical language. They'll be able to sort of be able to speak about the ways the business will describe things as well. And that's 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 what you want to get there to help people feel more engaged. Definitely. I think we're probably getting near time. Any, any other points that you, you wanted to get across at all or any any final comments? Wow. You know, apart from processing the cloud, there are always processes uh, on desktops. <laughs> so yeah. if you are limited with, uh, if the process you want to automate, it's not only touching the cloud, there is always RPA. But that's a whole of the different conversation i think that's that's a whole we'll get you back on for a whole nother session on that. And, and i think you know i was speaking with a client today and we were talking about yeah swivel chair processes you know where you type it in over there and then type it in over there and those are you know prime for rpa and that that can be a real enabler for for organizations to optimize processes Genuinely, for a while, thought you meant when you got an email, it makes your chair spin around. That, that yeah, swivel away from actually. Outlook. Yeah. When you Please, when stop. you receive an email, swivel yeah. away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would be quite useful. No, but um, thank you. Uh, I think it's really interesting, and I, I, I hope it's got people thinking about the sort of things they can do within that. I'm certainly going to be uh, going in, going into looking at some of those universal actions and. Um, what you can mm, do yeah with that dates that's really interesting yeah, just just maybe like last one comment about those cloudflow processes is that um as a citizen of cities sorry as season devs uh, we have like a lot of power to create really sophisticated uh, cloud flows and and processes um using what we have out of box in uh in power platform however um we should not think or should not limit ourselves to, to think only what we have out of box, but try to extend this thinking as well to what we can achieve when like working there with dataverse with the data that the processes are mm -hmm. gathering uh, and collecting. So um, with approvals, as, as mentioned to this um, the conversation, there is a certain steps or certain things we can do out of box. However, when working directly with the data that approvals is, uh, is collecting, we can do just unlimited number of, of scenarios and th those process can be way more flexible and uh, and crafted to, according to the customer's requirements. So just just try to not not be uh, stuck within the box. Just just go out and then see what what else is possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's where nice we can sort of draw some of those diagrams. Don't worry about what Power Platform can do. Work out what people want first, then layer that back into what the Power Platform could do and, and make sensible decisions afterwards. Yeah, I definitely. Could. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I'm, I'm hoping where um, where can people find out more from you or do, do you have sort of YouTube, Twitter, anything like that? Everything, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the whole lot. I'll, I'll grab um, some links and, and put those right. in the show notes uh, and things like that. Um, where can people hear more from you? I know I know you were mentioning before the show you've you've just been in Oslo. Um, have you got more things coming up soon? Well, yes, uh, I will be now uh, speaking at the Scottish Summit, uh, June, Thanks. and then well, I have like a summer holiday break. But after the break, uh, I will be at a South Coast Summit for sure, and uh, ESPC. Uh, in, in Copenhagen. And then, well, maybe there will be something else in between. Let's see what time brings. <laughs> yeah. uh, however, however, yeah, I mean, uh, if if uh, if you're able to like meet with me in person, then I would be very glad to to uh, meet you. And that's uh, that's uh, to to our listeners, our viewers. Um, <laughs> yeah, however, not, not us. You don't want to see us. us. Yeah. 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 yeah, you'll see you'll see <laughs> us as. You'll see us at Scottish Summit and run the other way. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, however, however you'd like to like, maybe learn from me a little bit, then uh, the YouTube channel is the place where I'm really focusing a lot recently. And I just realized that writing blogs is not that very helpful and explanatory to the users. I mean, not as much as the as a video where I'm showing step by step what I'm doing. So, 
so yeah i'm going to pause there nigel price if you're listening please don't send any abusive messages we know some people like blogs we know some people like videos it's fine all right so just to just to um excuse myself or explain this the <laughs> statement is that um i do still write a blog uh however i'm trying to write blog posts as a some kind of a support to the video so like when there is a yeah, lot of technical information that like a lot of code a lot of uh, steps that have to be uh deeply described and obviously video is not the best way to show text and in such situations and as we're writing blogs uh just to write down all the steps with the technical information like samples of code um what, what i'm doing in that video so it's it's connected <laughs> yeah no, I abs- absolutely agree. I, d- I know it always kicks off walls on Twitter when someone asks us, like, should people do more videos? Should they do more blog? Let's not get into that at this stage of the show. <laughs> yeah. I can see Elf's face well, there. Yeah. It's, it's whatever, whatever you feel like creating, and we're thankful for all the content absolutely. that you create. Absolutely. Whatever format. Absolutely agree. No, it's fantastic. Well, yeah, I, I will put those uh, into the show notes. So do ha- check out greyhatbeard.com. Uh, yes, it's not greyhatbeardprincess.com. We are kind of thinking about what we can do best with that. But, yeah, you know, typing, that's a long one there. So uh, more to come on that soon, hopefully. But uh, so much. Thank you very, very much. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, in the Scottish Summit in a few weeks uh, as well. Be nice to uh, meet properly. Um, we... Uh, we uh, I'm trying to think who we've got next. We will be back uh, shortly. Um, I am can't remember from the top of my head who we've got coming up uh, on there, but we will have some more guests coming up. So do keep an eye out uh, on the Twitters and all the, the socials and things like that. But we'll come up. But uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, I've been Grey. I've been the hat. And we'll have the beard and princess back soon. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, thank you. Thank soon. you. Yes, have a great uh, evening. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.